Oh, this. See if I can share things without issues. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need another I'm going to cam. I'm going, yeah, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> Perfect. So um, I'll just start off with typically this is a piece of a much larger presentation that I do around the transition to adulthood and working with adolescents with FASD. So I'll often speak to some of the larger topics that people are managing. So, you know, um, interacting with schools, managing healthy relationships and dating, uh, possibly justice involvement, substance use, um, you know, risk factors uh, around you know, sex, sexual exploitation, peer relationships, all of those things. So generally when I do this presentation, it's a much, much larger presentation, but um, what we really wanted to focus on is like, specifics in terms of transitioning. So we're really just going to break it down today. Um, I'm kind of, you know, I'm good with the conversation. Interrupt me if you have a question. Um, and yeah, we'll just have a conversation. Just in case people don't know, I think most people know here who I am, but uh, Shannon Foster and I run or I am the uh, communications chairperson for the Manitoba FASD Coalition. I used to be a Manitoba IT worker. I see Christy is here. Hello, Christy. Um, and now I own my own private practice and I do a lot of specialization in working with kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, providing alternative therapy practices for them. So that's me. Um, so transitioning to adulthood. This reference might be starting to get a little old, but I always think it's funny. Uh, so <laughs> I, I keep it in there anyhow. I'm sure I'll have to change it as you know things change in our popular culture. But um, adolescence can be so demanding and challenging, and it can really feel like it lasts forever. However, it's actually a really, really short period of time, and so quickly our kids are adults. Uh, we only have so many years to really kind of plan for adulthood, and all families, not just families with kids that have FASD, are worried about how their children are going to turn out as adults. Um, with our kids with FASD, this is no different. And if possible, it's practical. It's pro it's probably there we go. It's Monday morning, um, even more stressful for families. So, like I said, we're really just going to kind of tailor our focus today. This is the transition to adulthood in a nutshell. This is planning. Where do we go from here? And there's so many factors. What we'll do is we'll kind of break it down to kind of, uh, two different phases. Are your children under 16? And you know, nowadays they even say younger, 14, 15, or are they over 16? And we've really got that short window of time before they are adults. Um, right now we can look at under 16. These are the years that it feels like adulthood is so far away, but it's not. And we really need to begin looking at assessment and reassessment, um, especially as kids are you know, entering high school. And we also want to be looking at teaching independent skills, even at this young age. We can't wait until kids are 17 or 18 to be helping them learn budgeting or um, teaching them, you know, how to, to check their online banking information or things like that. We really, really, especially with our kids that are concrete and need repetition to learn, we have to be starting at a really young age. So when I work with um, families who have kids that are right around the age of 14 or 15, these are the conversations we're having. Was your child assessed and at what age? A lot of times um, I meet families that their only psych assessment was done when they went to the FASD center or um, through the school when they started having some difficulties in terms of keeping up with their peers academically or maybe some behavioral challenges at the school level. And we get an assessment that may be around 10, 11 years old. We cannot hang our hats on that assessment. Um, when we look at applications for CLDS and things like that, they want recent assessments. So they want things that are done right around the 15 and a half Kind of age range on an average um, to be looking at. So these are conversations that we need to be having at that age. When we look at assessments, 
where, who, how do we get these? And these are the conversations we often have. A lot of times assessments can come through the school. Saying that there's a lot of schools that have wait lists that are very long, um, or you might receive some pushback if the school themselves are not seeing a lot of behavioral challenges and if they're really managing the child well through uh, accommodations and adaptations um, sometimes the schools might not be an option and then the question is where do we go from here a lot of times um, kids can have cfs workers involved or cfs agencies um, they might have children's disability services already involved. So those might be two really good options and those conversations need to start at a very young age with, um, with their workers, whether it's their community living or sorry, community disability or through their CFS worker talking about where does this come from? A lot of CFS agencies will only cover one assessment throughout the, the time of the child being in care. So we have to use that um, in a way that's most effective. So a lot of times, well, if a school is saying we have a really crazy wait list and we won't, uh, we won't do an assessment in the child's 12, if the CFS agency is saying, well, we will do that assessment now, you almost want to hold them back because if that's the only assessment that CFS will pay for, it's too young to be used for an adult services application, right? So you have to really kind of balance where that assessment is going to be most effective if CFS is only going to pay for one. Um, the other option, if services are not involved, can be private, which is often a very um, expensive way uh, for families who may not have the money. Um, they can be a couple thousand dollars, but for those families who do have the financial ability to do it, private is an option. So there's kind of different areas that we can look at. I always recommend going through the school and if we can get the school to do it, um, it's really important that there's a WISC done. We need that IQ score. Unfortunately, as many of us are aware, when it comes to getting services in the province, that magic number of 70 tends to be the criteria that we base a lot of things on. There are some wiggle room in there, uh, uh, wiggle areas in there, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but that number is so important. So we need that WISC to be done. The other piece that we really need to be done is the ABAS, which is the uh, adaptive living skills. And so the ability, um, to be able to do day-to-day -day things like pay bills, um, you know, keep your hygiene where it should be, manage your own apartment, those kind of pieces are taken a look at with the ABAS. And so when we do eventually apply for services, they're looking at that number in terms of intelligence scores, but they're also looking at adaptive living. So those two pieces are the most important pieces in any assessment. Um, and then that independent skills piece. And this is a huge topic. It seems simple, like, yeah, teach them how to cook, teach them how to balance their money, um, you know, teach them how to ask for help when needed. However, it is not as easy as it sounds. There are so many pieces that need to be managed. Um, and a, what I'm really seeing a lot in my families that I work with is the switch for parents. For years, we have been telling parents that you need to be the scaffold for your children. Um, you need to help them. You need to make accommodations. Let's, we can do the changing. They, they are the way they are. Let's change our approach. Um, how do we manage these things? And really about having them approach kids from a brain-based perspective, um, having them be the huge advocates that they need to be at the school levels and with services, reminding people that my child has a brain-based disability and these are the best ways to approach them. So suddenly when these kids turn into adolescents and we ask parents to give them some freedom or um, let them make mistakes because that's the way we learn, it can be a really, really difficult switch for families. Um, I've had a lot of families who have struggled to make that change um, because they're going, well, my child has a disability. It doesn't matter if she's 16, you know, developmentally, she might be more around 10 and I wouldn't let my 10 year old drive a car. Absolutely, completely understand. 
However, we do have to allow her to make some mistakes. We have to allow her to, um, to try and then build resiliency through trying. And that can be a really, really scary concept. I'm not saying, you know, let your 16 year old get in the car and start driving and just hope for the best. Like we're obviously talking risk management here. Um, but that switch from my child is a child to my child is a teen is very difficult for families and it takes a lot of support not just for the kiddos but for the caregivers um, and independent skills and teaching these every day is so essential for these families because it helps not only the kids learn the skills that they need to but it really helps reassure caregivers that what they're doing is setting their children up for success and that um, you know in the end I've done the best I can and like any parent, I have to let my child be free at some point, right? And, and let them fly the nest and hope for the best. <laughs> um, this can, you know, independent skills can be taught in so many different ways. And I don't wanna harp on this piece, but it is so essential. You see so many families that when kids um, are 17, they start putting these things in play and it, it's really almost um, a little bit late to be starting those things. We need to start them when they're so much younger because it takes our kids a little bit longer or a little bit differently to learn these things. Um, so every day being really, really consistent, using really great tools like the accessiblechef.com for kids that want to learn how to cook but are super concrete and very visual. It's an excellent, excellent learning tool for kids. Um, money management, budgeting. This isn't just here's a worksheet. This is how, what, how money works and fill it out. This is grocery shopping with them, having them add up what you're buying in the grocery store on their calculator as you go, teaching them about taxes, inputting those things into their phone. So they have the tools that they need to use when they themselves are going to be adults, maybe unsupported, maybe they are supported, but they need to have an understanding or have the tools to make life easier for them. Um, there are some really good independent living skill courses it depends what community you're in. And so a lot of this is going to be general because we all live in very different <coughs> Some of the um, supports that you might have in Winnipeg or in the Interlake, you might not have in the Power Thompson. And so I, I'm staying away from very specific programs because I don't want anybody to feel like, well, that's great. I don't have that in my community. What's that gonna do for me? <laughs> so thinking general, um, teaching these things at home or if there's classes and uh, things that you can sign your kids up for, groups, that kind of stuff in your communities. Excellent, excellent resource. School is also a really great place to teach independent living skills. I'm sure we've all heard it, but academics don't always have to be the major focus of going to school. And especially for our kids, we want them to stay in school, enjoy school, and come out with things that they're going to use for the rest of their lives. And that might be independent skills. That might be the ability to build relationships with others. That might be um, knowing how to work in the cafeteria, um, helping out recycling programs. All of those things build so many skills and about self-worth and ability to know that they can be an active part of community. These are the building blocks that they're going to need as adults. So if you can get independent education plans or adaptive education plans through a school to really focus on essentials and things that these kids need as adults, that's where you're going to get a lot of work done too because they're with our kids every day. Um, another option that some communities have and it seems to be growing and growing in the province is action therapy. A lot of the work with teenagers, especially those aging out of care with or without FASD that I see is with action therapists doing cooking classes, cooking skills, teaching budgeting, um, helping them make their own appointments and get to their appointments. A lot of these pieces can be done with action therapy. And if you've got all of this going on, if you've got the school teaching things, they come home and you're teaching things and, even, and then they've got an action therapist that's coming out with them and taking them grocery shopping and teaching them things, that repetition and having everybody work together is where you're gonna see the best success for your kids. So under 16, let's focus on reassessment, let's focus on numbers, and let's also focus on building independent skills. Over 16, crunch time. And there's a lot 
going on here. This is going to talk about that number, where the IQ matters. Is the child eligible? We truly see community living disability services as that gold standard. And it comes with its pros and cons, and we'll talk about that too. But can your child get approved for these services? If they can, let's work on that. Um, what we do need to look at is that number. If your IQ is lower than 70, let's start now. Get that application in. Get all the pieces together. You're going to need all the assessments. You're going to need um, you know, the application process, all of these pieces. It can be a bit of a wait, so we need it to get in. One thing that we really need to focus on, too, or has come up, is whether the child lives on or off reserve. Province-wide, we have a lot of reserves um, that our children are, are going to become adults and are living on. What's really important here is when they live on reserve, that's considered federal. Community Living Disability Services is a provincial program. So if a child has an IQ lower than 70, is becoming an adult and will live on reserve, Community Living Disability Services will not provide them services on reserve. Does that mean we don't apply? You can make that decision. Um, we've had teens that are aging out that we have applied and got approval when they were 17, even though we knew they were likely going to continue to live on reserve. But the idea was if they've been approved once when they were younger, that approval lasts their entire life. It's a voluntary program. They decide whether or not they want involvement and they can move around the province for the rest of their life. They might be on reserve. In five years, they might move to Winnipeg. At that point, they could contact Community Living Disability Services and say, when I was 17, I was approved. I want support now. And they can start working on that. But if we don't do the application when they're young, they will have to go through that whole process when they're 25 or whatever age that is, with likely not a lot of supports to go through the process. And likely would need new assessments and then will they take adult assessments like there's just so many issues there so even if your child's going to live on reserve but you know they would be approved for community living it is a good idea to at least get the approval and to at least send that application in and see what they say um, when we put that application in, obviously there's two issues, or two uh, results, sorry. You can either have approval or denial. And this is where a lot of people had questions. A lot of people who were emailing me for today were like, what do we do if they get denied? What are our options? Let's talk about approval first, pretty simple. They get approved, yay. They, uh, they will have a SIS assessment, which is an assessment done to see where they need support. If you haven't done one of these, be prepared. They can be three hours long. So if you are invited to an SIS assessment, make sure that you block out either your entire morning or your afternoon, whenever the appointment is, because they will take some time. Um, they focus on what the adult is able to do with and without support. Um, they, you know, they will figure out can they cook by themselves without being a risk? Can they pay bills and not be, you know, um, not be taken advantage of financially by others? Those are the pieces that they're looking at. It's a very long assessment. Be ready for it. Um, be honest and as open about um, areas of challenge and areas of strength as possible. Um, often, the CFS to CLDS transition will happen right at 18 if there's an approval. So if a child is with an agency, CFS, and they are going to CLDS, there's some wiggle room and all different agencies that have all different ways of handling this. But generally, as of their 18th birthday, CFS will wash their hands and say, okay, you're CLDS now, go for it. And it is, can be a very abrupt change. And some families feel like the transition should be a little bit um, maybe more both-sided but it typically isn't, um, it's typically very quick. CFS is done, CLDS takes over and that's all there is to it. The other thing that will come up once approved is whether or not a child or adolescent, or sorry, as a, an adult will need a subsequent decision maker. Um, this is a piece that I see a lot. Um, I actually have to go to a hearing in July 
for an SDM application for a child or for an adult, sorry. And uh, there's a lot of confusion around SDM. A lot of people say we got to get that SDM in because they can't make their own decisions. They're going to spend all their money on, on junk food or they're going to you know, buy all their friends meals and they're not going to have money for groceries. Um, you know, they're all these risks, all these things we're very worried about when our, when our kids become adults. We're worried they're going to be taken advantage of. We're worried that they're vulnerable. We're worried that they're going to make poor decisions and that they're going to get themselves into some harm. All valid concerns. What we need to remember with subsequent decision makers is that if an approval is granted at the court level, it is lifelong and only removable in a court of law. Um, it essentially deems them legally incompetent in specific areas of their life. Um, an SDM is not all encompassing that has changed over the years. So now you can have an SDM for financial decisions, but every other decision your child or your adult uh, gets to make. Um, you know, you can have an SDM in uh, health matters, but yet they still get to make their own cho choices in their financial space. So it's really about specific areas of life that you can have an SDM applied for. Um, but what we need to remember is that all of our individuals who are with Community Living Disability Services have the right to make good and poor decisions like any of us. I have not made perfect decisions in my life. There's been times I've made poor decisions and I had the right to do that and take the consequences. And our adults that live with a disability have the exact same right. And sometimes we worry because we understand that they are more vulnerable or we worry that the risk of harm for them might be higher than uh, say for me. Um, but they, they have the right to make poor decisions. And we, can't, we don't wanna take that away from them in a way that deems them incompetent for the rest of their life when, when they're 30 or 40, they might have the capacity to make good decisions. Um, for example, if you put an SDM in place for financial reasons, you're worried that a 18 year old is going to um, spend all their money on clothes and not have money for groceries. Granted, there's a risk and there's a harm in there, but any 18 year old could do that, not just an 18 year old with FASD. And so we have to figure out whether or not that risk is going to continue lifelong or if there is still growth available and if there is the ability for them to learn as they grow and as they mature. Um, the concern here is if we get an SDM for financial reasons, we have to realize that that person might grow up, get married, have a husband and kid or a wife and kid, and they would still not be able to make their own financial decisions and their husband or partner would also not be able to manage their money because they would still have an SDM. And so it's lifelong. We, and to be able to then prove somebody competent when they've been deemed incompetent legally is incredibly hard. So I guess what I'm saying is just be really, really cognizant of the application for an SDM. Is it truly that they are never, ever going to be able to do this? Or is it we're worried because they're 18 and they're young and they finally are living on their own and they finally have some of their own money and they're going to go a little crazy and maybe spend all their money on candy or, but will they learn from those mistakes eventually and be able to do it? If so, then probably an SDM application is the right way to go. If they are not going to be able to learn and they will consistently be financially vulnerable, then there's definitely a case for an SDM. It's just not a knee-jerk application. I think there needs to be a lot of thought that goes into whether or not SDM is applied for. Um, also, part of CLDS taking over, when our kids graduate from high school, there is about a three-year gap. So um, there is a gap between 18 and 21 where Community Living Disability Services funding will actually kick in. And a lot of the programming and things that happen um, in between the ages of 18 and 21 uh, are actually taken from the education system. So a lot of times if your kids uh, are graduating at 18, you'll see some schools will not put in the uh, diploma to the province. They will hold it back. 
your child has graduated, went to the graduating ceremony, but then might come back with some extra courses or do um, ACL or um, uh, work placements. Those are all through the education system. So we want to make sure that if possible, the education system stays in line um, for, um, for the foreseeable future until the age of 21. Because otherwise, there's kind of this financial gap where nothing can be really given in terms of resources, um, like day programming and things like that in between 18 and 21. I'm just mindful of the chat. Yep. Sorry, did I say STM? I meant SDM, subsequent decision maker. <laughs> so that's gold standard. We've gotten approved. What happens when we're denied? And I think we've all been in this situation. You have, from the moment that you get that letter or the date of that letter, you have 30 days to appeal. You have to let them know that you will be appealing. They will set a hearing. Now, I'm sure everybody's had a different experience and they can only really speak to my experience in it. Um, it, you know, I, it was an interesting experience in the way that um, this application was denied. He had an IQ of 72, so his uh, IQ was two points over. His, his uh, psych assessment and his ABAS, so his adaptive living, were kind of quote unquote wishy-washy, which was literally something that was written into his psych report, so that was really frustrating. Um, but essentially, we went and said, we have new information from the school uh, saying that a WISC was done and his IQ is lower. That was not known before we went to the appointment. And we spoke to them about his executive functioning abilities, as well as the fact that when the ABAS was filled out by mom, it was in a justice capacity. And mom wanted to make him look as best as possible. She was really strengths-based. She was going, my son made a mistake. He's really good at this. He's really, I'm trying to make him look great because she was worried that the justice system was going to take one look at that and, and charge him. Um, in the end, we, he still was denied, um, and I do believe it's still in the process, but um, it is you sitting in front of a hearing panel with CLDS, and in my experience, CLDS is legal counsel. Um, so it was me against lawyer, <laughs> which was really fun and, un and unexpected, um, but really you're there just to prove why you think that approval is needed. The best chance you're gonna have is if you bring in new information saying it was denied and you're going, but look, we have new information and really speaking to um, where they struggle, their areas of challenge. Um, we have had kids that after the appeal process, they were approved. I've had kids who were still denied. And when that youth was denied, they did send in the letter, a statement stating, we understand that FASD is one of those gaps, one of those areas where the um, different brain domains can be impacted in different ways that doesn't speak to just their intelligence level, but we don't have recourse to approve them at this time. So is this this really general statement that just said so much about FASD being an indivisible disability and the fact that our kids can have IQs that range from 20 to 120 and you know, it can really hold them back when they do need these services. And it's recognized, but even at that level, they don't know what to do about it. So maybe in the future, we'll see some change. Um, sorry, just looking at the chat here. Okay. Um, yes, so I would just be prepared. You have that 30 day window, bring as much new information as possible to the appeal process. Having somebody that knows the child really, really well, whether it's a school resource teacher, or your, um, you know, a case manager, whatever that looks like, be able to support the family in there because it can be quite intimidating sitting in front of a board of people with a lawyer at the other end. So, yeah. If they continue to be denied, the next question becomes, where do we go from here? Is CFS involved? Is probably your first question. Um, if they are that opens up a different avenue in terms of giving us at least a few more years of wiggle room, possibly if an extension is done. Um, if they're not involved, what kind of services can we connect this child to? Are there um, community services like FASD programming? For example, we know in Winnipeg, we have Life's Journey. 
They continue to, uh, to support individuals with FASD who don't have community living invo involvement. Um, is there co-occurring mental health stuff going on for our youth? Can we get mental health services involved like um, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association or are there things like employment services that will take on different youth that can help them main, uh, find, maintain a job, all of those pieces? Is EIA something that needs to be looked at for, for your youth so that they have financial stability? Um, so the, the question is, what are they eligible? For, sorry, and in terms of, um, you know, each community is different. I think most of us have probably seen the video with Chris, and I didn't put it in today because I just know that we're on a really tight um, time schedule. But that's a community that has supported an individual with FASD who wasn't really eligible for many things, and he became really involved in one of the centers in town that was there, and they helped him be a part of his community and make those connections as needed. It's really about what can your community do to keep these individuals a part of the community. Um, you know, for example, in uh, Southern Manitoba, we've got rural connections. Winnipeg, there's a couple of different options. Uh, Manitoba Possible or Society for Manitobans with Disabilities is what it used to be called. Um, it has many provincial locations. So just really being interested in, in what is available in your communities. Because if CFS is not involved, if CLDS won't take on the adult, we have to think outside the box. We have to be creative as possible. If CFS is involved, we're still looking at these things, but we might have some wiggle room. Is an extension of care or what they're now calling AYAs, adolescent, no, ad AYA <laughs> is what they're also calling them. And it's an agreement between the agency and the, uh, the adults. Um, no. Agreements with young adults, there we go, AYA. Um, and each agency is different. So some of the things that I have seen, uh, thank you, Lori. <laughs> some of the uh, things that I have seen um, have been agencies that once they're 18, they don't do a lot of case management stuff, but they will provide a stipend or a financial piece to help kids get on their feet and rent their own apartments and things like that. But they're very much on their own in terms of managing that money. Um, a lot of these ones I'm seeing come out of Ontario for kids that still live here, but are supported by um, Ontario's Child and, Child and Family Services. Um, a lot of it is the case management ends, but here's money. Whether or not that's a good thing for our kids. Some of the other things I've seen have been agreements between adults and agency where there's a lot of different conditions. So you're going to continue to um, go to school. We'll support you finishing your education. That's why you're staying in care. Um, we're going to get you into an independent living program. We want to assist you do this, this, and this. So there's just different conditions that the, the youth and the agency agree to um, that is about supporting that youth to be a successful adult and a couple more years of having supports. And it's very much vulnerable, uh, voluntary for that youth to continue to be in care. And I think that's the big change. Once a youth is 18 and they agree to continuing to be in care, they are their own legal guardian and they are in agreement with staying in care. At any point, those kids can say, I'm out. Yes, there's some paperwork and some conversation and all those things. But they do have the right to say, I don't want to be in care anymore. And that is a big change from being a 17 year old to an 18 year old in CFS. Um, a lot of things that I have done. So, for example, I have three different kiddos right now that I'm working with that are all in this 17, 18 age of transition or age majority transition piece. Two of them are not eligible for CLDS. Both of them are in different independent living programs. We thought, this is a nice transition. One of them is in Nazawin, one of them is in uh, Nadinaway second stage housing. And just the idea of having a support network for them where they can learn those independent skills, learn how to budget. Uh, a lot of these independent living programs are built upon a tiered system where they start kind of like an infant stage where they're still living in a place that might be um, kind of like a group home where they have their own suite, but a communal kitchen. Um, they're on their uh, their own for breakfast and lunches, um, and they get gift cards for groceries to go and purchase their own groceries. Um, 
and then together as a home, they have dinners together. Once they do really well at that level, they move on to the next level, which might be they get their own apartment suite in an apartment complex that is completely owned by the program. One suite might be staffed, it's always on hand, but they are living in their own apartment, supported in a safe way. So there's lots of these independent living programs that have done really, really good work with our kids that aren't gonna be supported by community living, um, who don't have places to go when they're 18 and the age of care. And it just really teaches them a lot of skills and helps them to continue to be supported while they're managing that 18 to 21 kind of age. One thing I do wanna say about the extension of care, a lot of people get that and then they kind of relax. They go, okay, we got another few years or another six months or whatever the extension is. It's not a time to relax. This is a time to be doing the hard work. If they weren't taught already, these like independent skills every day consists all of those things. You've got an extra six months to three years to teach them everything that they didn't get already. And, you know, between us, we know there's not a huge difference between aging out of care at 18 or aging out of care at 21. If you didn't do anything with those three years, you have to make sure these kids are ready to go. We have, you know, some of these kids are not going to have the supports that we know that they need. And we have to try and teach them as much as possible in these times. Yeah, so um, AYI is like Lori is saying, can only be approved for a maximum of one year at a time. Some, some agencies I've seen do six months even, um, and then they'll do it one year depending on the agency, but they will, they can only go up to the age of 21 in my experience. And every year, when I said those conditions, every year that transition plan or that condition that has the conditions of what the agreement is based on um, is assessed and is as signed again. It's a, a document that is, it warrants a conversation, see where they're at with their goals. Um, and it's, it's always about a conversation between the agency and the adult to see where are we going from here and is this continuing to be supportive. All right. What else? What else? So one thing that I have come up against, um, oh, thank you, Laura, I didn't know that. So COVID is allowing extensions beyond 21 right now um, who for youth who are not permanent wards, but we're not sure if this continues. So, hey, one benefit of COVID, we're getting some longer <laughs> extensions. Um, one big thing that tends to be a bit of a surprise for families is the difference between CFS and CLDS. When your child has been uh, supported by CFS for many years, that can look like um, costs of therapy covered. Um, that can look like help with purchasing clothing. Um, that can be respite, that can be support hours. That's you know ongoing support from Child and Family Services. CLDS is a completely different ballgame. And we see them as gold standard because then we have supports and services for the rest of their life that they need. But those supports and services are very different than, than CFS. And I think a lot of families are very surprised and almost feel blindsided when a child transitions from CFS to CLDS, not realizing the vast difference. The Hands down, the biggest piece is the fact that your child is no longer a child. Legally, they are an adult regardless of vulnerability, regardless of that child having an IQ lower than 70, they are an adult and they can make their own decisions, good and poor. Um, we already talked about subsequent decision makers, um, but really recognizing that at any point, these adults can tell CLDS, I don't need you anymore. It is completely vulnerable, uh, voluntary. Um, and obviously, CLDS workers are very uh, experienced in managing adults who, who maybe say, get mad or just like, I don't want you in my life anymore. Um, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. And we'll often, you know, kind of take a step back, not close the file, but take a step back and just, you know, let it sit for a little bit and see if that adult comes back about a month or so later and say, you know what? Yes, I do need you. I'm sorry. Or nope, I still don't want you. Get out of my life. And if that adult says, get out of my life, they have to. CLDS will close the file. That's not to say that they won't reopen it in five years if that adult come back and says, whoops, I made a mistake, I need help, 
I keep losing my apartment, I can't keep a job, or whatever those things are, CLDS will pick them back up again. They have been approved when they were young. They will always be approved for the rest of their lives. That's my experience. Um, but that is a huge difference. That adult is in charge of their life. No one is telling them. There's no authority to making decisions for them unless there's an SDM or subsequent decision maker. But even that, that's on only specific areas, remember. Another piece is what's covered and what's not. So when a child is um, in CF CFS, they have maybe built a relationship with a therapist for three years. They've been seeing the same therapist for three years. Therapy is covered, CFS pays. Suddenly they're 18, payment is gone. And community living disability services will not pay for therapy. So if that youth, who is now an adult, obviously you know, doesn't have the money to pay for themselves, therapy services will end. Um, obviously there's some differences in terms of whether or not they're treaty or if they have victim services involved and things like that, but it's just one area that is a big change. Things that were covered before are no longer covered. They don't get clothing allowance anymore. It's out of their own money and they have to budget for that. So that can be a really hard change um, and really unexpected for families who expect that CLDS is just going to pick up the ball from CFS and keep running, but it's a completely different program. And a really big change too for families is where CFS will do a lot of communication with caregivers um, and it tends to be very kind of multi-systemic. CLDS is very much about, we talk to the adult. It doesn't matter if your mom, you're no longer their legal guardian. I don't actually have to talk to you about this stuff. I have to talk to the adult. And parents can find that really difficult because they feel like, well, I've invested 18 years in making sure this adult got to you. I want to be included in the conversation, um, but CLDS has to make sure that that adult wants them at the table. And if they say, no, I don't want my mom to know, mom won't know. So there are some really big changes between CFS and CLDS. And just make sure that families you're working with understand they are completely different programs and they are seen very differently. And you'll find a lot of them um, are very worried about vulnerability and the VPA guiding principles. So the um, Vulnerable Persons Act, which is the legal act for uh, individuals who have an IQ lower than 70 or, or deemed vulnerable in a court law or approval process, um, is written in a way that says these adults have the rights to make good and bad decisions. They are presumed to make their own decisions. They are encouraged to make their own decisions. If they need help to make that choice, there's legislation that encourages families friends and service providers to help them, but it's an informed decision. You cannot sway their decision. It is their right to make good and bad ones with all of the information that you give them. Um, and all help must be provided in a respectful way, meaning you cannot go above and beyond. You can't go to their CLDS worker behind their back and say, well, I know they told you this, but I really think that we should do this because they're gonna get themselves hurt or what if and what if and what if. And as a caregiver, we all have those concerns, but legally, they are able to make their own decisions whether we agree with them or not. Um, I get this, so right at the bottom here, it's going to talk about subsequent decision makers. There's a decision that they are unable to make, even with help, as a last result, a substitute decision maker can be identified in a court of law to make decisions for them. It's a process. And like I said before, it deems them incompetent in that area to make decisions for the rest of their life, unless it's taken back to a court of law and it's almost impossible to get it overturned. So it needs to be as a last resort that those SDM applications are voted. This is accessible online. Um, I think I, I can give Kim the, um, the link. Most people who work with individuals who are vulnerable uh, should have this somewhere on their, their office wall or something like that, that just reminds this is the guiding principles of the BPA. Um, for example, if an adult turns 18 and goes, I don't want to take my meds anymore. We have to make a decision of whether, or they have to make that decision. If we deem that that's a huge piece in terms of harm, or, you know, harm reduction, or they're going to get themselves into trouble, there could be an SDM made, but you have to prove that they cannot make that decision. There's lots of people at 18 that says, I, I don't want to take my meds anymore. And there's lots of people who are living in the world who are unmedicated. They were allowed to make those decisions 
everybody is. So it can be real, it can have a lot of, sorry, question? Nope. Okay. Um, there can be a really scary piece for caregivers and case managers because we worry obviously about these youth and adults getting into trouble and not being able to get themselves out of it. We just hope that the foundation that we built for them is strong enough that they, you know, when things go wrong, they come to us for help or that they learn from their mistakes, um, just as we do with any kids that turn into adults. But yes, I will give the link uh, so that everybody can access. this. Yes. Okay. So the other piece is these lovely kiddos that turn 18, no CFS involvement, not going to um, have CLDS in their life because they don't meet criteria. Now what? Where do we go? Like I said before, we're looking at what can your community do for them? What kind of accessibility and, and resources do you have in your communities? Because it's different in every community. And where are your natural supports? Um, this is important. Paid supports, even for those people who have resources in their life, whether it's CLDS, CFS, uh, EIA, whatever, they cannot be the only supports in their lives. The paid workers are not their friends. Um, they have the right to have friends outside of the home. They have the right to have family members supporting them. Um, you know, how can we support them that don't meet services? Is there an auntie that lives in the same community of them that likes to check on them every couple of days? Is um, there a family friend who owns a business who's like, yeah, I'd hire them. Um, do you have somebody who has a basement suite that maybe they could rent it out so that you have um, maybe security that they're living with someone who has eyes on them? There are some really creative things that we've come up with that have helped kids. Um, one thing that we really need to keep in mind, I was at a Vulnerable Persons Act training with Community Living Disability Services and something they said just really stuck with me. Out of the people who are in the province that have a disability, there's probably, at that time, I think she used the number about 27,000, 30,000 people living in Manitoba who have an IQ lower than 70, who have a disability and would be deemed vulnerable. CLDS on any given time probably supports on average, 6,000 people across the province. That's a huge gap. There are 20,000 people living with disabilities, vulnerable people, not supported by community living disability services because maybe they told them, I don't want you in my life, applications weren't done, whatever. There's all these people living out there with disabilities and living their lives. We have to trust that our kids, our adults that have disabilities have the ability to live their lives too. We just want to provide all those safety nets for them. And so that a lot of times is natural supports. Um, that's not just our kids that don't have CFS and CLDS. That's everywhere. Are they with CLDS? Are they still with CFS? Do they not have any of them and they're living with family? Where are these natural supports? This is the biggest piece. How do we support these kids? And I recognize a lot of our kids that come out of care don't have these. This is harkening all the way back to under 16 independent skills, beginning to look at assessment, building natural supports. Where do we go from here for these kids? Um, we've talked a lot about these things, so family, community, service navigation, the rights of vulnerable persons to make good and bad mistakes um, or decisions, the need for social inclusivity, whether that's groups, youth drop-ins, um, church groups, all these pieces can be really supportive to, to individuals with disabilities. And just recognizing that services are not 100%. Even gold standard services in the province are not 100% and they can't be there at all times. So just building on that piece. Last piece, and I know we're getting close on time. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever done a path with a school. I just think it is such a beautiful way of, and we haven't talked about it yet, but including that youth in their own planning. And it shouldn't even say, I shouldn't even say including them. They are doing their planning. We cannot plan around them. We cannot make a plan for them. They have to be first and foremost in any of these plans. It is their lives, lives. it is their plans. And if they are not engaged, 
anything that you do for them will fall apart. They have to believe in what they are planning for their own life and we have to support them. Are there ways of doing this that are better suited to our individuals with FASD? Absolutely. Visuals. Look at the PATH program that high schools use right now. Um, they draw it out. This is one that was done with uh, one of my youth that is now actually in CLDS, but her transition plan. We were there for hours and we talked about what were her goals. Her goal was to travel the world. Cool. It's going on there. I don't care how unrealistic or how much support they're going to need to do that. Or I don't care. It's going on there. So she wanted to go to Red River Photography. Great. You want to you wanna go um, travel to Toronto to see your sister. Great. That's going on there. These are your goals. And now let's work backwards to get there. So if in five years you want to be in Red River College, where do you need to be halfway there? Where do you need to be in a couple of years to get there? Where do you need to be six months from now to reach that? Where, what do you need to do tomorrow to be able to get to those goals? Red River College, well, you got to graduate high school. And if you want to graduate high school, what do you have to do? You have to pass all your classes. If you want to pass your classes, what do you need to do? you got to get your assignments in. Do you have any outstanding assignments right now? Yeah, okay. Do you need help to do that one for English tomorrow? Let's do it. Like building it backwards to show them that the work that they're doing today is going to add up to the work that or the things that they want in the future. This, um, this path that's drawn here was probably about eight feet long. It was on a huge piece of paper. We drew it all out. We all took a picture at the end um, so that we all knew her plan and she took it home and it has stayed on her wall. For the past two years, she's just moved into a residence uh, through community living. She took it with her and it was the first thing that went up on her wall. Because for her, it's her plan. She knows who's supporting her. She knows the people who are there. Um, because at the bottom, if you look, it's all comments that we left saying, you know, we believe in you or call me when you need me or whatever those things are. She knows her support. She knows her plan. She knows how to get there. And this can change, obviously, but it was just such a good moment for her to feel like people are supporting me to be successful. And if we don't support our adults, if we don't support our youth in their own plans, anything that we do plan will, in the end, fall apart because it's not their plan. So in any of these points um, that we've talked about, including them is essential. There we go. <laughs> that is my snapshot. Oh. of the age majority transition in a really quick um yeah breakdown shannon, i think that was helpful <laughs> absolutely fantastic shannon now how how do you want to work this i know people have been putting um a questions on you can obviously see it are you okay with with kind of monitoring that and and answering the questions and i guess if other people didn't do it on the chat um they can just get off their get off their mic <laughs> put uh, get their mic off and ask questions so what however you want to um continue yeah i think okay so there's two on here mary you said you offer the training on a biannual basis and if we have extra spots we welcome others to join us for the training which training are you talking about mary sorry i don't know where you're from I am, um, I'm from river east transcona school division so we offer the path facilitation training Awesome. It is hands down one of the best programs that I have seen the schools run for for our kids that are planning their lives. Um, yeah, if anybody hasn't done PATH or would like to take training and can ask Mary to help them with, you know, get connected, excellent. Uh, Dorothy, how do you deal with the cutter? Ooh, Dorothy, we don't have time for that. <laughs> it is... Um, you know, I think that might be a question where we could talk separately, but like I said at the beginning, just this this snapshot of what I help uh, families and youth to do as they're, as they're aging out or getting close to that age out period um, is a snapshot of a much larger presentation. Um, the presentation I normally do talks about those pieces, talks about what do you do with self-harm? What do you, how do you help kids who by the so way- I have a 12 year old, so she's dealing with a lot of uh, trauma middle school yeah it you know what I think it's a huge conversation Dorothy for and 
maybe even you can stay on um, at the end of this and we can chat a little bit. Like I'm totally open to that um, because in the end, the reason of why they're cutting, where that's coming from, all of those pieces matter to how to help them stop cutting, right? So if it's trauma, how do we deal with it? still have that there. So I'm also trying to figure out how to deal with everything. Yeah. Why don't you, do you mind staying on a little longer um, at the end so we can chat and we can figure out some stuff? Sure. Anyone else have questions? I just, um, I have a question, um, Shannon, if I may, just back to um, the subsequent decision maker. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of recognizing if that's sort of something that you don't a decision you don't want to take lightly is there are there other um maybe more from a harm reduction kind of a standpoint approaches that you could suggest to supporting um transitioning teens or adults that might need a little extra support with financial decisions or health decisions but if you're trying not to go the route necessarily of a subsequent decision maker Totally. I think, uh, I think obviously each individual is different and they have their own strengths. It, it really helps to know um, where their strengths are in terms of their brain, right? So if they're visual learners, if they're verbal learners, if they're hands-on learners, that's really going to advise you in a way of what the best way to teach them is, right? They learn, they learn differently. Where, how do they learn best? And so if you've got a visual learner, you're going to want to make sure you've got all of those visual, visual adaptations um, for example, I have one kiddo who struggles with her financial um, uh, financial areas. So what we've done, um, because she, she her phone is her life, she, her phone, as many of our teenagers, or her phone is her life, we built things into her phone for her to go shopping. And so we, and we just re repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. Every time she would go out, we would go to a grocery store, we'd go to a restaurant with a, then her mom and myself. Um, we had her type in everything that we were buying, whether it was at a restaurant or a grocery store, um, and then times it by the tax. And then she know, and it just got to a point where we didn't even have to ask her to bring out her phone. The moment we'd step into a grocery store, she'd bring out her phone. She's like, okay, I'm ready. And then she'd like add everything in her cart as she put them into the cart, into the phone and kept track. So she knew how much money, um, that she would have to have in order to buy the things she wanted. We had memos in her phone that would say, remember to add the tax and like, we put, you know, one times by 1.12. And then at the end, it would get your total, that's the tax. And so we just, it was repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. And this is actually um, the youth that her CFS worker, without any of us knowing, put it in SDM uh, application for financial reasons. And so this is the hearing I have to go to in June. I don't think they're going to give her an SDM because the work has been done that she you know, she's made a mistake, she learns from her mistake and she doesn't do it again. Um, or, you know, she's worked really hard to be able to ask people for help. She uses her supports, but all of that was probably three years of work with her, of doing it all the time. Now she's 18 and she can do it for herself, but there was three years of consistent work of doing that. Um, you know, and there's still mistakes. Uh, she is now on EI. So she's got this money that just magically comes into her account. And uh, it took probably one month of her spending every ounce of what was in there and then going to a store, swiping her debit and there was no money and she had to put things back, which she found really embarrassing. And that's a hard lesson that we've all learned. I'm sure I've done it at the grocery store too. But after that, she has never spent to like every dollar in her account. And she asked us, well, how do I save money? How do I not do that again? Because she didn't like the feeling of being embarrassed at home. So it was a very natural consequence as our kids learn from, and she's done the work. Did she make a mistake? Yes, she did. Did she learn from it? Yes, she did. And so does she need an SDM in that area? Probably not because she is learning. We just, I guess my, my point is we have to give our kids the chance to learn from their mistakes before just cutting them off before even letting them try. I think Chrissy Thank you. had a question uh, on a chat. Chrissy, I don't know where you are. Did oh you yeah, uh, the testing request. So um, the IQ test that we generally do is the WISC. So the W-I-S-C you've got in there. And then the ABAS, which is the, oh my goodness. 
acronyms, Adaptive Behavioral Assessment Score, maybe? ABAS <laughs> is the one that they do for adaptive learning. Don't quote me on what the acronym actually stands for, but it's something like that. Any other questions for Shannon? That you can write in the chat or just unmute yourself. No? Again, Shannon, boy, thank you so very, very, very much. Um, I'm sure that if people have other questions, so there you are, um, we can, uh, they can uh, email you if that's okay, oh, if you're okay with that. But again, um, it was just fantastic. Um, so thank you so very, very much for taking the time to do that. Um, we will move on um, to uh, networking around table.